Let's pray together. Lord, that song that we sang, that is, that's our faith. That's what it's about. I need no other argument, no other plea. Truly, it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And I thank you and I praise you for the reality of that. And I pray, God, now that you would help us as we look into this glorious subject of salvation through Jesus. God, that our hearts would be stirred. That those of us who are believers would be excited, renewed excitement about our faith. That those, God, if there's anyone here who is uncertain about their faith, or maybe someone who has never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray that this would be a day that they would understand the seriousness of not knowing Jesus. And I pray that they would turn their hearts and their lives over to Jesus Christ and become his child today. That is my prayer. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Father asked his young son if he knew if he knew how a person gets saved, and his son said, we, we, get, to, we get saved by, by going to our church every Sunday. The boy said that without hesitation. But the dad was like, no, son. While going to church, going to our church each week is a, is a very good thing to do. It does not get us saved. To which the boy promptly replied, well then, I... I guess it's time, Daddy, that we find another church to go to. And I want to be clear. Okay, let me be clear. No, I want to remove all doubt. I don't want you to go to another church. I love having you be part of this church. So don't take that and run with it in any way that I do not intend, okay? Can I trust you on that? I hope so. But what I do want us to do is I want us to be a church that is very clear on what salvation is all about. That we understand this vitally critical doctrine of our faith. Last week, last three weeks actually, we've been going through the study of sin and understanding that. And I think that that was foundational then to be able to really prepare us for this week. Because this week we get to study salvation. Salvation is the sovereign work of God, whereby, based entirely and exclusively upon his all-sufficient grace and finished work of Jesus on the cross, he forgives sinners, excuse me, guilty sinners, and delivers them from the judgment that they deserve. That is our definition of salvation. It's the work of God. It's done entirely upon him and is based entirely upon the work of Jesus Christ. And so what is salvation all about then? That's really going to be our topic for this morning. And I would suggest to you that there are three primary things about salvation. Three things that we are going to look at here this morning. First of all, salvation is all about grace. It's all about grace. That's why we sang our songs about that. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes about this in this incredible passage here. And of course, we, mo many of you could, could quote verses 8, 9, and 10, but I want us to back up to Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. Have you follow along as I read some verses to you here. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Simply put, my friends, without grace, there would be no salvation. None. It is purely of grace. Grace is God's unearned and unmerited favor. Grace is God offering to us his love and mercy, even though that is the last thing we deserve. What we deserve is the absolute opposite of that. But that's grace. 
Grace is God pouring out his love to us through the sacrifice of his precious and holy son, even though, as we just read here, we were dead in our transgressions and our sins. Grace is God drawing us to himself. It is God saving us through Christ, even though, as Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says, that as sinners, we were actually God's enemies. We don't deserve any goodness from God, but yet he gives it. That's grace, that unearned, that unmerited favor. And I love the way that Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great preacher of the past century and who ministered in England, he, he said this, there is no more wonderful word than grace. Oh, I love that. I really think if there's just one word in the English language that I had to choose as my favorite, I think it's grace. He says, there's no more wonderful word than grace. It means unmerited favor or kindness shown to one who is utterly undeserving. It is not merely a free gift, but a free gift to those who deserve the exact opposite. And it is given to us while we are without hope and without God in the world. Isn't that incredible? That's what grace is about. What we deserve is God's wrath. We deserve eternal punishment in hell. We deserve God's judgment because of our sin. And yet, because of grace, all because of God, this unearned favor he gives to us, because of his grace, he offers to each one of us salvation. Salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, every religion in the world teaches that there are certain things that people must do in order to achieve salvation, wh whatever that means for them in that religion. But I want you to understand, Christianity is not a religion. It is not about what we must do in order to earn God's favor. It's not about what we must do in order to earn salvation. Christianity is a relationship with the living God of the universe. That is astounding what that means for us. Salvation, it's all about God. It's all about Him. It's all about His grace. It is Him making it possible for us to receive that which we could never earn or possibly even begin to deserve or acquire on our own. There's absolutely nothing for us to do except receive God's free gift. And God has already done all the work of salvation through Jesus Christ. Which, by the way, explains why some deacons, not, not part of this church, but there were some deacons in a church and they, they became very concerned because they were talking to a, to a young man. It was the interview process of hearing his testimony of faith before he could become a member of the church. And so they asked him, they said, well, how, how did you get saved? Tell us about that. They became very concerned, though, because he, his response is, well, God did his part. And I did my part. Okay, that was, that was definitely not quite what they were expecting and certainly not what they had hoped for. So they said, you need to clarify that a little bit for us. And I love his answer. He said, well, God did the part of saving and I did the part of sinning. And I ran from God as fast as I could and God took out after me until he finally ran me down. <laughs> that is grace. We were enemies of God because of our sin. And I think that the more we reflect upon the reality of the grace, I think the more that, I don't care if we've been a Christian for five years or 50 years. I don't care if it's been 10 years or, I was going to say 100, but I don't think any of you are that old. The reality is this, grace, God's grace. Don't ever get so secure in who you are or think that it's, I'm a little puffed up because of the fact that I'm such a good Christian. No, grace, it's all about God. Salvation is purely because of the grace of God. He ran us down. He drew us to himself. He did all of the work. We did all of the sinning. God freely and completely offers it to us. And that, my friends, is grace. And certainly, salvation is all about grace. Secondly, salvation is all about Jesus. I want you to turn to the book of Acts with me. Acts chapter 4. Peter and John, two of the disciples of Jesus, 
they were leaders in the early church here. Jesus in, in Acts 1 had just ascended back up into heaven. And so Peter and John, they were arrested now here in chapter 4 uh, by the Jewish religious leaders because they kept proclaiming to everyone that they met, they kept proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Well, the Jews did not like that because they were the ones who put Jesus to death. And so what they did is they threw them in prison and after letting them stew in prison over the, overnight, they brought them then before the Jewish high court and they demanded, no, in no uncertain terms, that they needed to stop talking about Jesus Christ. I want you to see Peter's response. <laughs> this is so cool. Acts chapter 4, verse 11. Remember, he's just spent time in prison here. He says this in verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Oh, do not miss this next verse. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. See, contrary to the, to the things that we might hear or the things that we read or the, the things that people present to us in, in arguments or the philosophical views of people throughout the world, but in our postmodern world of, of relativism, which basically says that there's no absolute truth and everything is relative, what's good for you is good for you and what's good for me is good for me and I can't say that that's wrong, I can't say that that's right because there's no absolute truth. That's the world that we we live in. But I don't want us to be uh, directed by that. I don't want us to be so strongly influenced by that because the reality is this. Scripture makes it very clear to us that there is absolute truth. We do not need to think that truth is all relative. It is not. And God makes it very clear in his scriptures that part of the truth of the matter is this. There is salvation in no one other than Jesus Christ. And you will hear many people present many other views, and I tell you the truth, because we believe in the truth of Scripture. The tr Scripture is so clear. Jesus is the only way. You know his claims. You know John 14, 6, where he's there with his disciples. This is the last night. He's going to be betrayed in a few hours. He's going to be crucified the next day. And he tells his disciples, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through through me. That is absolute truth. It's been said by some that grace is a five-letter word that spells J-E-S-U-S. -S. I think that's very well said. God's grace is poured out upon us through Jesus. Now, since we are all experts on sin, and <laughs> I'm talking theologically here, okay, because we have just spent three weeks going through sin. This is not me saying that you guys are, wow, you guys are amazingly adept at sinning. I'm not saying that. If that's true, I'm going to just let that lie. Uh, I know that I am adept at sinning. I don't know about you guys, but the reality is, hopefully, because we spent three weeks together studying sin, we are experts in understanding what that means. But I want you to think about this with me. Because of our sin, we know what we deserve, right? We deserve eternal punishment, separation from God. But everything that we deserve because of our sin, everything, Jesus took upon himself for us. Everything that we needed because of our sin, Jesus accomplished on our behalf. In fact, let me give you four quick examples of that. We deserve to die because of our sin, but Christ died for us. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. We deserve to die, but Jesus died for us. Another example. We deserve to bear God's wrath, but Christ was our propitiation. Go to Romans chapter 3 with me, please. Romans chapter 3. You know, one of the things, I was, I was reflecting on this a few weeks back, one of the things I really love about the fact that we're doing this series on doctrine is we just get to turn to so many different passages of Scripture. And I think that that's great. And I love hearing the, the ruffle of pages as you guys are, the rustling of that as they are, you're going to different passages in your, in your Bible. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. That word propitiation, we've talked about it many times. Uh, it's just an amazing word. It's only used four times in, in the entire New Testament, but it's such a powerful word. Propitiation means a sacrifice that appeases or turns away God's divine wrath towards sin. The NIV uses the phrase there, instead of propitiation, it calls it a sacrifice of atonement. That is a good translation of that word, but I would submit to you that I think propitiation itself has a, a little bit more intense meaning than just the atoning sacrifice, because it is truly this sacrifice that appeases or turns away God's wrath. That's what's so important about it. We understand this. God is holy. He is perfect. He is just. He is righteous. There is no sin in him. There is no shadow of sin within him. He is perfect. We, on the other hand, are sinful. God in his perfection has to hate sin. We talked about this the past few weeks. And because of that, in his righteousness, he must therefore punish it. He cannot let it go. He cannot overlook it. That would, that would uh, violate God's perfection, his holiness, his righteousness. But this is a marvelous thing. Jesus stepped in. And he took that punishment that we deserve because of our sin. He took it upon himself. <laughs> what grace. What love. We deserve to bear God's wrath. But Christ was our propitiation. Also, we deserve to be separated from God. But Christ reconciles us. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul writing here. This marvelous thing that happens in salvation. 2 Corinthians 5, I want to begin reading verse 17. Again, a verse that many of you could quote. But I want to go beyond just that verse. But notice verse 17 with me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Making or God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The miracle of salvation. That is just absolutely incredible. Picture, if you will, this huge, deep, uncrossable chasm between us and God. One, on one side is God in his absolute perfection and holiness. And on the other side, separated because of our sin, separated from God, is us. Sinful. Deserving of God's wrath. Deserving of his punishment. And there is nothing we can do to bridge that chasm. Nothing. We, oh, sure, we can try to do a lot of good works. We can try to maybe do some acts of charity. We can try to maybe give some money. We can try to do some things. But the reality is that this chasm is so big, it is so deep, it is so long, it is so wide that there is nothing we can do to get over to God. Our sin is a separation, this gulf between us. But then, that's when Jesus went to the cross. That is when the sinless became sin for us. That is when the divine took on human flesh so that he could actually be killed in our place. And that is when he made a way 
of salvation. That is when he bridged this gulf that we could not in any way get across without Christ. He made a way to God. And the only way to God the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. We deserve to be separated from, from God, but Christ reconciled us. Last example of this is that we are in bondage to sin, but Christ ransomed and delivered us. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Oh, I love that. I love that. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and He's transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Man, that is just so powerful again, what Jesus did. Now, we talked a lot about this the past few weeks, but let me say again that we have been freed from the bondage of sin, and it's all because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Again, I remind you, everything that we deserve, all of the punishment, all of the judgment of God that we deserve because of our sin, Jesus Christ took upon himself. And what he did, what he did is, he gave us his righteousness as he took our sin upon him. Oh, what a Savior. What an amazing Savior that he would do that. I tell you, salvation is all about Jesus. Thirdly, salvation is all about faith. It's all about faith. Go back to Romans 3 again with me, please. Romans 3. We left off in verse 26. I want to pick up in that same spot beginning in verse 27. Then Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? <laughs> it is excluded. Well, yeah, we have nothing to boast about, right? He goes on and says, by what kind of law? By a law of works? No. But by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of of the law. Go to chapter 4, verse 23. He's talking about Abraham. He's talking about Abraham's faith. And I want you to go, Romans 4, verse 23. Because then he makes a comparison between Abraham, his faith, and then us. He says, but the words, it was counted to him, that's referring to Abraham, they were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we read earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So, so what is faith? I want to just be really clear on that. What is faith? It is both an intellectual belief in God and a trusting belief in God. I think that's at least part of what the author of Hebrews is referring to in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, when he wrote this. He said, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Okay, that's the intellectual part. You must believe that he exists, that there really is a God. And he goes on, he says, and that he rewards those who seeks him. That's the practical part. That's the trusting belief. It is, you cannot separate them. Biblical faith is both intellectual and it is practical. And I believe with my mind that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he did die on the cross for my sins. I believe that he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death forever. But I also must believe in a practical way. It's not enough just to believe intellectually that he did that. I must apply it to me. That means to trust him. That means to place my faith in a way that I'm trusting him for my salvation. It's not enough for me to believe that he did what he said he did. I have to personalize that. I must accept him. I must trust in him. I must believe that what he did applies to me and therefore that my, the salvation is mine. It's an intellectual and it is also practical. 
It's a trusting belief. I am saved because I believe that what Jesus, I believe in my mind that what Jesus did or said he did, that he did indeed do. But I'm also, I am saved because then I take that intellectual belief and I personalize it and I am trusting in him for my salvation. I have claimed that I have received the gift that he has given to me. That's part of, that's, that's faith. And that is my part in salvation. Jesus did everything. He did everything that's needed to be done. I did nothing except receive the gift that he gave me. Let, let's say, for example, while I've been preaching here, and I know you guys have been mesmerized and not looking out the window, and you've been staring right at me, and so you didn't know this, but while this, this message was going on, what I did is I had your vehicles all removed, and I had brought in 50 brand new vehicles in the parking lot here, and all of you guys, yeah. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire, no, um, but no, I, I have bought, I have paid for these vehicles. Now I'm going to tell you, it cost me everything that I have. I should say, it cost me everything that I had, uh, past tense, because now I have nothing. You know, Tammy and I are officially homeless and we are broke and we are penniless. So invite us over for dinner, please. We need a place. It just costs us everything. Now, now I'm not Oprah, who maybe does give vehicles out here, but, but I got to tell you, I love you guys. And, and so what I want to do is I wanted to be able to help you all out and I figured you, who couldn't use a new vehicle? So again, brought them all in here. All you have to do is see me after the service and I will hand you the title and I will hand you the keys to that car. Now, let's say some of you, you're like, oh, Rick, that, that, is, that is too much of a gift. I know what this costs you. There's just no way that I can accept that gift from you. And maybe others of you are like, <laughs> I don't believe it. It has to be a trick. It's too good to be true. Besides, I know we don't pay him that much money, so there's no way. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, now, let's just say, that for whatever the reason, some of you, some of you go home without a new car because you refuse to accept the gift that I've given to you. Maybe your intentions were good. Maybe they weren't. But if you don't accept the gift, it's on you. That's exactly how our salvation works. If you do not accept the free gift of God's salvation and then someday you face eternal judgment, I want you to understand that is on you. That's all on you. That is not, not on Jesus Christ. He did not fail in somehow what he did. He, perfection was accomplished at the cross. It would be on you. I want you to listen to this poem. I thought this was really interesting. It was written by a woman named Martha Snell Nicholson. I sinned, and straightway, post haste, Satan flew before the presence of the Most High God and made a railing accusation there. He said, this soul, this thing of clay and sod, has sinned. Oh, tis true that he has named thy name, but I demand his death, for thou hast said, the soul that sinneth it shall die. Shall not thy sentence be fulfilled? Is justice dead? Send now this wretched sinner to his doom. What other thing can righteous ruler do? And thus he did accuse me day and night, and every word he spoke, oh God, was true. Then quickly, one rose up from God's right hand, before whose glory angels veiled their eyes. He spoke, each jot and tittle of the law must be fulfilled. The guilty sinner dies. But wait! Suppose his guilt were all transferred to me and that I paid his penalty. Behold, my hands, my side, my feet, one day I was made sin for him and died that he might be presented faultless at thy throne. And Satan fled away, full well he knew that he could not prevail against such love for every word my dear Lord spoke was true. 
salvation is all about grace. It's all about Jesus. It's all about faith. And God offers it to every single one of us. Jesus has done everything necessary for our salvation. And so I challenge you, if you have never done so, or even if you're like, you know, I'm not really certain. I'm not sure if I've really accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, then I say to you, please, 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 won't you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning? Won't you do it now? Won't you please receive the gift of God's salvation that he is offering to you? Jesus did it all. All he wants us to do is receive the gift because our salvation, oh, it is so rich. It is so free. But it costs God everything. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would stir in our hearts right now the reality of who we are, the reality of our position. God, I know, I know that most of the people here have accepted Jesus Christ already as their Lord and Savior. I am so thankful for that. I am thankful for their belief, their trust. I am thankful for their faith. And God, I pray that you would help all of us to be so excited about our salvation, not taking for granted anymore this thing that maybe we have had for years and years, but realizing again, wow, we deserve death and punishment, but Jesus came out of his love and he showed grace. Well, God, help us rejoice in that. But God, I'm not going to make the assumption that every single one of us have accepted Jesus already. And so I ask you, if there is anyone here today, God, who has not, or if there's anyone here who is sitting here and thinks, you know what, I, man, I'm just not sure. I mean, I, I said a prayer, but it didn't, I don't know if it really changed my life, and so God, I'm just not sure. Father, for anyone who may be either uncertain or very clear that they have not accepted you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would change their hearts this morning. Pray, God, that they would understand their need for a Savior. I pray that they would understand that Jesus is the only way. And I pray, God, that they would understand their need for a Savior so that they would indeed confess their sins. They would admit, God, in the quietness of their heart right now, they would say, God, I am a sinner. I have messed up more times than I can remember. But I believe that Jesus did die on the cross for me. I believe that he can save me. And so I ask Jesus now to do that very thing, to save me, to make me his child. God, that I would certainly have the belief intellectually of what Jesus did, but more than that, I would claim it. I would, in trusting Jesus now as my savior, I thank you that he did it all. I thank you that all I have to do is say, Jesus, I receive this gift of salvation. Be my Lord. Let me follow you now all the days of my life. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for your Son. And thank you for the faith that you give us to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. In response to the message this morning, we have this song on the monitors, Grace Closed Down. Let's stand together, we're going to sing it through twice.